Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar on using international standards to improve cybersecurity, not just in the United States, North America, of course, but around the world. I'm Alan Calder. I'm your host for today. I'm also your main speaker for today. I'm I've been in the world of cybersecurity and international standards for now about 20 odd years. I set up IT governance as a single source supplier of products, services and solutions for organizations tackling information security some 10 plus years ago. Uh, I led the world's first successful implementation of a management system that met the requirements of what was then uh, BS7799 and is now ISO 27001, back before the turn of the millennium, uh, and have since then been a writer and consultant to organizations, but more and more, of course, involved in the growth of IT governance as a company, providing that range of products and services to our clients uh, around the world. and. Uh, increasingly uh, and excitingly for us in North America. I'm going to be talking today about the current cyber threats. This is going to be at a uh, reasonably bullet pointed level looking at the key uh, key issues and breaking down some of the recent profile, high profile data breaches to look at the underlying causes that enabled those breaches to come about, uh, a brief review of legislation in the United States insofar as it relates to data and data breaches. Uh, I'm going to look very briefly at President Obama's proposed data breach notification law and how that fits in with uh, what's happening around the around the rest of the world and, and the extent to which that's important. And I'm going to look at how the international cybersecurity stand, ISO, IEC 27001, can help organizations get their business to be cyber secure. You'll all have noticed that you are in mute mode. That we find tends to work better for everybody. It means not much background interruption and noise as we're going on, but uh, GoToWebinar has a whole bunch of tools that you can use. Uh, there is a chat function which you can use to uh, type in messages. Uh, anytime you need to ask a question or raise an issue during the webinar, please use the chat function to communicate with me and the team who are on uh, standby. I've got the chat webinar window open and can, can follow that. There's also another section called questions uh, and you can use that simply to type in very specific questions which um, again I'll uh, pick up uh, and, and respond to. I'm paying more attention to the chat window than to the questions window so uh, do bear that in mind in terms of how you, uh, how you bring things to my notification. So, going to look at current cyber threats, and there's going to be a quick Q&A session at the end of this webinar, so don't think that if you've got key questions, you can only ask them through the chat function. There'll also be an opportunity right at the end to ask things in loud or quiet verbal format. So, current cyber threat, there have been 783 data breach incidents in the US in 2014, 783 individual data breach incidents, which led to the compromise of some 348 million individual records. That's 348 million people's records compromised. And you can see, knowing what the population, adult population of the United States is, that a number of people will have had uh, their records compromised on two or more occasions. The biggest sectors from the perspective of data breaches are healthcare and general business, general business in particular, uh, technology, uh, media, finance companies, but the broad business sector, healthcare of course because of the value of the personal data which uh, is available from healthcare businesses. 88% uh, of uh, those who are attacked believe that cyber attacks are amongst the three biggest threats facing organizations this year and in the future. And that 
kind of ties in with what we see around the rest of the world. So the European Union, for instance, sees uh, cybersecurity as a top three priority. The United Kingdom sees cyber risk as one of its four key strategic risks uh, facing the country uh, over the next five to ten years. So cyber attacks amongst the three biggest threats facing organizations uh, and therefore in need of uh, being addressed appropriately. The White House talks about cyber threat as being one of the most serious economic and national security challenges that in the US uh, we face as a nation. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS, says that constant cyber threats against uh, critical infrastructure and economy are being mounted on not just a day-by-day -day basis but a minute-by-minute -minute and a second-by-second -second basis coming from all around the world and we know from the work we do with clients around the world that companies that fail to adequately protect their networks are at an increasing competitive disadvantage and we see that from work we do with clients in every single marketplace uh, that we operate in. 46% of US companies have been asked to provide their security credentials by customers in the past 12 months and that's not just in the form of a single customer asking for an individual consumer customer asking for information but it's commercial B2B customers saying before we contract with you if you contract with us we require uh, and looking to see that there is firm and clear evidence of information security uh, best practice compliance in place at the organization prior to doing business. The problem is, of course, that the threat landscape is continuously changing. So just as an example, 87% of uh, iPhone's top 100 apps have already been hacked. 97% of uh, top 100 apps for Android phones have already been hacked. So, you know, when you go onto the uh, iStore and download an app, one of those top 100 apps, there's only 13 out of 100 that haven't yet been hacked. Android is, however paranoid you are, Android is a, uh, for most people, uh, it's an open source software. Uh, there are terrific opportunities for hackers to uh, break into apps. And of course, hackers get into apps because it enables them to access information about you that they want. Imagine if when you log on to an ISP to download your um, Android software upgrade, uh, there is a man in the middle attack going on which diverts you to an alternative um, spoofed site which downloads a version of Android that looks as though it's the one you want but actually has got some malware built into it which tracks your every keystroke uh, and data collection as well as your geographic position from then onwards. So Android apps have been hacked. 100% of companies have experienced malware attacks. Of course, not always uh, have those malware attacks been successful. Um, malware is much broader than viruses. Every, every organization has suffered a virus attack. There are 156 million phishing emails sent in the United States every day, and most of them originate in the United States. Phishing emails, as you know, are those emails which look as though they've come uh, from a credible uh, uh, organization and they're asking you to provide some form of information or other and of course we think we can spot most of those now because uh, they're poorly uh, structured and written but that's not the case. The reality is that phishing emails now are professionally put together by cyber criminals who understand that uh, effective phishing emails is the fastest way to bypass an organization's uh, defenses and get malware installed on a network that will exfiltrate critical data and valuable uh, information. 115 million of those phishing emails actually make it through uh, email filters uh, and the average global cost for every stolen record in the United States is $145, is $201 in the United States in comparison with an average cost outside the US of $145. That either means that uh, you have uh, more valuable information in the United States or alternatively it means that it's easier to get at lots of valuable data uh, all at the same time. So when you look at the threat landscape and the changes to it, how 
how did these attacks take place? Well, something like 42% uh, of breaches were caused by uh, malicious or criminal attack and and please don't for a minute think that because you're not in the healthcare or general business that you're not a target. The reality is that uh, the vast majority, 90% plus of attacks are focused on exploiting specific vulnerabilities not focused on specific industry verticals. So 42% of attacks were driven by cyber criminals, 29% uh, were system glitches and 30% of them are human, uh, human error. When you look at the uh, breaches, what was the key cause inside the organization that led to the security failure in 65% of cases, existing controls simply didn't work effectively. In other words, the attacker um, was able to evade those preventive controls. And think also of uh, human error as a form of attack. Think of system failure as a form of attack. Uh, you put security controls in place to ensure that if there is a, an inadvertent system shutdown, you don't lose uh, critical and valuable uh, data. Lack of in-house expertise was cited by just over a third of respondents to our survey as being a key reason why as an organization they were breached. They just didn't quite know what they should have been doing or how to respond to particular uh, successful attacks. In 20% of cases it was a failure to effectively vet uh, or manage security in a third party. We'll look at one specific instance uh, of that shortly. In 15%, uh, poor leadership was cited, and that's not just poor uh, information security or IT leadership, that's also poor board leadership, it's poor corporate leadership that fails to recognize the immediacy of cyber threats and the need to take action to deal with it. Once we get below poor leadership, then of course, uh, inadequate organization of where you store sensitive data, lack of data classification, lack of accountability, all of these are uh, causes of uh, breaches, are reasons why attackers were able to exploit an organization and exfiltrate valuable data. But the most important is inadequate security controls, inadequate management, poor leadership, lack of expertise. Those are the core areas why organizations suffer breaches. Target, many of you will be aware of the story of Target. Uh, major uh, retailer, several thousand stores across the United States and elsewhere. Uh, just before Thanksgiving in 2013, a journalist identified the fact that there'd been a possible breach, there'd been some suspicious activity going on for a short while beforehand. But Target decided that uh, their systems were secure and they didn't need to do anything to deal with the possible security breach, and so they didn't. And um, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, it became clear that not only had they been breached, but uh, in the end some 110 million customers' records had been Compromise. That's payment card data, personal information, addresses, uh, driving license, social security numbers and the like. And the way hackers got into uh, Target was of course through a supplier. They uh, managed to log into a, an HVAC, a heating and ventilation supplier uh, who had inad inadequate security themselves for which you read uh, Target failed to manage their supply chain effectively. Inadequate security in the HVAC supplier meant that the attackers were able to get into the HVAC supplier's systems and from there they were able to get into Target's building management system. Uh, and from the building management system they were able to work their way into Target's point of sale systems, uh, get Anti-mal get their malware in place, uh, remain undetected for long enough to exfiltrate, as I said, 110 million uh, records. So, sophisticated phishing attack into uh, the HVAC supplier, moved sideways from the HVAC supplier into the business management, the building management system of Target, moved sideways from there into the point of sale system. Basic security measure for an organization like Target uh, would be to uh, put in place a uh, would be to put in place 
segregation in their networks uh, and putting in place segregation in the networks would ensure that, let me just get to where we were, would ensure that the attacker would not be able to get from the place that they were in to where they wanted to arrive at. So for Target and for its shareholders and stakeholders, uh, the real issue then became not just the size of the damage, but the reality that uh, profits were down for the first six months of the following fiscal year. Uh, costs associated with the breach are estimated to have reached something in the order of $148 million uh, in total. Uh, and that's before settlements of all of the class action suits and uh, actions brought by uh, state prosecutors for breach of uh, state uh, anti-breach laws. The CIO and CIS and CEO were both forced uh, to resign one after another. Uh, not a good result for shareholders or for the C-suite in Target. Target could have done things very differently. They could have segmented the network so that third parties would not have been able to access payment systems uh, or other sensitive information. They could have properly secured third party access to their network. They could have put in place an effective uh, supplier security management program which ensured that all suppliers to Target had adequate information security management processes and controls in place. They could have insisted on regular testing of their software to identify any malware early on. The uh, uh, executive board of Target could have made cybersecurity a priority in board meetings and had regular briefings from CISO and CIO on exactly how cybersecurity was being dealt with. All of those are things which would be normal for an organization which has got effective cybersecurity management systems in place. So that's the story of Target. Home Depot is a, another example of an organization which uh, had inadequate security. Home Depot, another huge uh, cross United States uh, entity which was breached in September 2014. Again, hackers used uh, compromised third-party credentials, in other words, uh, passwords and uh, usernames and access details to break into the network and install uh, a malware in the point-of-sale system uh, through an unpatched technical vulnerability. The breach in the end involved, involved some 56 million payment cards, some 53 million customer email addresses were compromised and Home Depot is uh, grappling with 44 different lawsuits and its spending to deal with the breaches uh, apparently exceeded $43 million. So again, absence of effective segregation in network, inadequate control of technical vulnerabilities, uh, inadequate C-suite uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation of the effectiveness of cyber security practices inside the organization. Big blow in terms of uh, bottom line costs, uh, big blow in terms of impact on the organization's uh, credibility and brand value. So allegedly inside Home Depot when uh, employees said what are we doing about cyber security we're not sure we're very good at it allegedly the response was we sell hammers here we don't do technical stuff uh, and um, well organizations that sell hammers also have IT systems which need to be protected and allegedly the antivirus system installed on the IT systems was uh, out of date it hadn't been updated to the uh, latest versions that hadn't been patched, patched adequately and the net result was there was something there that an attacker could exploit. Allegedly uh, the Home Depot had hired a computer engineer who'd been in prison for disabling computers at a previous organization and as information emerges it'll become clear where the links or it may become clear where the links between these issues are but again an organization with an effective uh, information security or cyber security management system in place would vet 
people in all of its key roles and many of its less important roles as a matter of course. The reporting to the board on how effectively uh, vulnerabilities are patched, how well uh, employee vetting takes place, how effectively the network is segregated, all of that becomes part of uh, business as usual. Dealing with key risks is part of what the board should be making sure happens. And when you fail to do that, you become the target for repeated breaches. Sony is a very good example of an organization which uh, is still struggling to get to grips with its core responsibilities around information security. There have been over the last couple of years uh, two major breaches at Sony, the, uh, the second most recent of which led to the compromise of more than 100 million uh, email names and addresses of uh, young people playing games on the Sony gaming network. The most recent breach was a breach of uh, Sony's corporate computer network, allegedly uh, an attack which was orchestrated and carried out by North Korea in response to a movie that Sony Pictures were going to release, but irrespective of whether or not it's North Korea or some other state level attacker or a cyber criminal that's got quasi state level uh, capability, and believe me, uh, national and international uh, crime organizations now have very sophisticated uh, cyber criminal capabilities. So hackers infiltrated Sony's corporate computer network um, and managed having uh, got in there to release uh, a whole bunch of Sony Pictures films that hadn't yet been officially released so uh, they put stuff out there onto uh, the internet ahead of launch date which kind of uh, undermines massively uh, uh, Sony's IP, its ability to sell, uh, sell movies but much more damaging was the leak of personal information about uh, employees, including uh, what uh, members of staff had to say about actors and actresses, uh, all of which was in theory meant to be kept uh, confidential. That's assuming it should even have been said in electronic format in the first place. But um, on top of that, lots of information about um, salaries, about um, sensitive information about people and addresses, contact details, uh, all of that leaked. Um, the uh, CIO, uh, his password file with uh, passwords in plain text, that whole file made it out onto uh, the internet and whole number of marketing slide decks. The outcome of that was that Sony staff were off work for a number of days, computer system compromised, not able to do any work while the security people worked out uh, what had gone wrong, how to patch it and fix it. Small mercy appears to be that uh, the interview may have made a bit more money than it would otherwise have done because everybody wanted to see the movie that might have sparked the attack, but whether the amount of money which the interview generates in box office receipts uh, and Sony's share of that is enough to cover all of the huge damage to the organization uh, done through this major attack uh, remains to be seen. So. Uh, class action suits coming from ex-employees, uh, costs so far have reached something like about $100 million. Uh, and interestingly, it appears that uh, Sony executives had been getting emails uh, that were suggesting that their network could be taken down. Uh, uh, they came with demands for ransom, but executives ignored them, treated them simply as spam, and that's not such a smart thing to do. They acknowledged the breach, took a, we a week to acknowledge the breach. Uh, by then, speculation was rife. Reputation gets massively damaged in the period between a breach and the point at which it's acknowledged. Um, and of course, the huge amount of spending uh, driven by what we would call a knee-jerk reaction, bolting the stable door after all of the horses have got up, danced around and run away, um, has led Sony to spend uh, $250 million plus on security, but not evidently in the right places, not linked to the key areas of threat not linked to dealing with key vulnerabilities and the net outcome is uh, Sony uh, not a good example of a secure large organization. 
The reality is that small organizations are just as exposed. So cyber criminals, to be frank, aren't just focused, as I said earlier, on large organizations. They're focused on vulnerabilities. And what they find interesting about small organizations is that small organizations have usually even less effective security than large organizations like Target and Sony. You'd look at a Target, a Sony, a Home Depot and say, okay, they must do something right where security is concerned. They've got a big budget, uh, they must be on top of it. Um, we in a small business, uh, how much more vulnerable are we when we probably spend even less time and effort on security than probably a Sony does? So. Smaller organizations usually no dedicated uh, IT security capability inside the organization. Uh, passwords and systems that can be easily compromised quite often. Operating systems that are out of date, technical vulnerabilities that haven't been uh, patched. Server hardware that might be out of date because you know we're trying to get another six months or nine months of life out of it before we have to replace it. Websites often built on common open source frameworks because that's less expensive. We don't want to pay money to the big uh, operating system vendors when we can get it for free. And of course, free brings cost. Uh, open source software uh, means that weaknesses are well known. They're easy to exploit. And if you notice some of the more recent um, vulnerabilities, Heartbleed uh, and others have been in open source software. So open source software, major benefits. Uh, you can see what's going on if you're a coder. Major weaknesses if you're not because usually hackers uh, and the guys who create the exploits that hackers use are pretty sharp uh, coders. They know what they're doing. 60% of small organizations that have been breached usually close down within six months. They kind of stagger on for a bit, half recover, but actually they never get back into business. Their customers tend to go, well, um, you weren't very good uh, last time around looking after my information or looking after uh, our information as a customer. We can't wait for you to sort yourself out. We move on and so the small company just doesn't make it. So given the state of cyber risk, given the number of successful attacks in the United States in a year, given the fact that cyber attacks are increasing in volume, sophistication and complexity month on month, let alone year on year, what is the board told? What is the uh, directors and C-suite told? Well, 32.5% of boards don't get any information from their uh, cybersecurity teams about what's being done about cyber security. How on earth can you exercise effective leadership if you don't even know what you're doing as an organization about cyber security? How do your cyber security people know what they should be addressing, what the prioritization around risks is if they don't know what your risk appetite is, if they can't have uh, an engagement with the board over what an appropriate stance is in relation to risk? 38% of the remaining organizations get a report only annually. Um, most of those reports, of course, uh, focus on all the good things that are being done. Uh, they don't tend to identify all of the glaring holes and weaknesses that uh, the security staff think might be in place. 29% of IT teams actually don't report breaches for fear of retribution. They're going to get sacked. Uh, they're going to get fired because the breach obviously is their fault, uh, irrespective of the fact that uh, they didn't have enough budget, they didn't have enough resources, they didn't have the direction and support of the board in tackling them. So many IT teams go, we ain't telling anybody, we'll try and cover up this breach because that way we, uh, we stay in jobs. IT security people have got uh, families and homes to support just like all the rest of us. Um, they're unlikely to want to report a breach unless they know that uh, they're going to be reasonably safe. So you say to yourself, let's go hire a cybersecurity expert, let's get somebody in. And of course, the incredible explosion in cybersecurity risk also means that there's an incredible explosion in the need for cybersecurity expertise. At last count, there were something like 209,000 unfilled cybersecurity positions in the United States, which is a 74% increase over the last five years. 
and the universities and professional uh, bodies are not producing cybersecurity professionals anything like fast enough to meet the requirements. This is not just a US shortage, there is a global shortage running in the millions of adequately capable cybersecurity professionals. We see that in the United Kingdom, we see salaries escalating the whole time. I tell my kids right now that they should bin whatever they thought they should do at university and go away and get a computer science degree and become uh, ethical hackers, ethical testers um, and they can get themselves onto a very fast increasing uh, salary ladder. Uh, ISACA report that 90% uh, of their members have said that there is a shortage of uh, adequately skilled people. 41% of their members expect to find difficulties in recruiting adequately skilled candidates and thankfully 58% uh, at least of them plan to increase their spending on staff training and that's spending on um, uh, professional qualifications like CISSP, uh, CISM, uh, ethical hacking um, and related uh, qualifications and others. Industry recognized qualifications is what you should be looking for um, in addition to qualifications from ISC squared and ISACA you should obviously be looking at exam boards like IBITGQ the International Board for IT Governance Qualifications but it's industry recognized qualifications that tell you that the certifications that individuals have got uh, enable them to tackle specific areas of what you need tackling to get cyber secure. So that's the state of the cyber threat market, that's um, what boards are doing, that's the kind of position that most organizations are in in dealing with it. Legislation is changing and developing in the and this is legislation around breaches. We've already had in the United States a range of uh, legislation dealing with um, online personal privacy, uh, but the key legislation for most organizations has become the data breach notification laws, which now are um, in place in 49 out of uh, 50 states. And of course, this is fine if you're operating in a single state, but if you're operating uh, across the United States then you've got a wide range of data breach laws to deal with. Some of them focus on organizations based in the state, others of them focus on uh, breaches wherever they might take place which affect the data of a citizen of the state. So if you're an organization like Target operating in multiple states you find yourself facing uh, multiple data breach uh, problems if you have a uh, cyber, a successful cyber attack and in preparing for uh, cyber attack of course you need to recognize that you've got a set of um, complex laws and you need to deal with them. On top of that you've got uh, compliance requirements like uh, PCI which is a contractual compliance requirement for all organizations that accept uh, payment cards and then depending on which particular industry vertical you operate in there will be uh, some form of uh, specific vertical related legislation. So HIPAA for instance is dealing with uh, individual information, personal, personally identifiable information of people who are dealing with the covered healthcare uh, bodies. Uh, very wide range of organizations fall into the covered healthcare provider gap. Um, uh, while SOX uh, is, is impacts many much larger organizations and deals with the accuracy and reliability of financial disclosures, one of the impacts of SOX is the emergence, many of you have already been aware of um, the requirement or have delivered against requirements for SOC 1 and SOC 2 uh, compliance reports and increasingly also SOC 3 compliance reports um, which enable uh, uh, organizations to meet their um, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance requirements because they've got adequate information about both control at subsidiary entities and also the management of risk at subsidiary entities. Federal agencies for a number of years now have been required to uh, implement appropriate information security programs drawing fairly substantially on uh, data and uh, um, standards made available 
uh, through NIST, but FISMA certainly impacts uh, federal agencies. So federal uh, industry-specific laws, GLBA is another that affects the uh, uh, financial sector in particular, uh, and these all cross over and have to be dealt with at the same time as do data breach laws. And of course, if as an organization you're trading internationally and you want to deal with, let us say, uh, an organization in uh, the European Union, you've got to meet European Union data protection laws, which are dealt with through a safe harbor agreement between the United States and the European Union. Uh, Canada has uh, PIPIDA. Uh, there, are, uh, there are laws in every single country which if you want to trade outside the United States and, uh, and increasingly in this global economy that's what happens, you've got to be able to deal with all of those compliance requirements. You need a structured way of doing so that uh, enables you to do this cost effectively. Remember the cost of data breaches is pretty hairy. According to the Poneman Institute, the uh, average cost of a data breach notification is about $509,000. If you add on to that the costs that occur after the breach, in other words, uh, restitution, um, uh, making good uh, damages and so on, the average cost is $1.6 million and the average loss of business is $3.3 .3 million. Uh, so you're kind of looking at uh, about uh, 5 million plus as the average cost of a data breach. This is average, across, average cost across all industries, all uh, organization sizes, uh, all breach sizes. It's not an area of damage given that uh, nearly 100% uh, of organizations experience attacks uh, and a very high percentage experience successful attacks a year. Not a good position to be in. And for years there's been talk about simplifying uh, data breach notification in the United States by putting in place a uh, federal Data Protection Act. Uh, the current attempt of it is called the Personal Data Notification and Protection Act, which is designed to put in place a single, strong, uh, quote, national uh, standard for protecting personally identifiable uh, inter information, which has a standard set of rules about uh, the period within which individuals uh, must be notified with significant uh, punishment for individuals who uh, breach it, uh, including potentially uh, officers of uh, entities that are in breach. But it's, uh, um, uh, it would have to pass as a piece of legislation. Uh, this type of legislation has fallen over a number of times already in Congress over the last uh, four or five years. Um, there have been a number of presidential initiatives to get this type of legislation passed. The absence of a single federal data protection um, act is one of the reasons that makes it difficult for US companies to trade in the European Union because the European Union, Union prohibits export of data to any country that doesn't have a national data protection act that meets the requirements of the European Union. But sooner or later one would expect uh, some form of federal level uh, data protection act to emerge and sooner or later those organizations who recognize that without it or with it what matters is getting on top of the costs and embarrassment of a data breach is the key strategic initiative that uh, organizations have to take in managing critical risk in the 21st century. And that means, first of all, a strong security posture, recognizing that security risk has to be managed, identifying what the risks are and putting in place resources and budget that would enable you to do that. Usually that means appointing someone as a chief information security uh, officer, uh, preferably reporting to the CEO, but uh, if necessary reporting to the CIO who preferably reports to the CEO. Uh, you kind of need security on the board agenda. You need an effective incident response plan because uh, as you've already seen, you're going to be breached. It's no good pretending you're not going to be breached because you will, so you need to be able to pick it up, respond, close it down and recover. 
uh, just as well as you need to be able to try and stop it in the first place. And a big part of how you do that is implementing industry standards. And by industry standards, we are increasingly talking about a single international cybersecurity standard, ISO IEC 27001, uh, the most recent version of which was published in 2013, is increasingly seen as the single international standard for best practice around cyber security. Its origins go back some uh, 12, uh, 12 or 15 years. The first version of ISO 27001 appeared in 2008. Uh, there is a good solid experience now around the world of implementing management systems that comply with that as a standard. There is an international framework for uh, recognizing companies that are registered as complying with the standard and so uh, an organization registered in one state of the US for instance would automatically be recognized as registered in all states in the US as well as anywhere else in the world. It's a globally recognized standard, it's a best practice framework for, for, identi for, for identifying and tackling the entire range of cyber risks and putting in place a management system that deals with people processes and technology, not just technology. Effective cybersecurity, as you would have seen from the case studies I referred to earlier, is not simply about putting in place the right endpoint security, it's also about putting in place processes which ensure that your software is updated, vulnerabilities are patched, that individuals have the right skills and competences, that staff are trained on how to avoid uh, getting caught by phishing emails. So systematic ISO 27001 is a systematic approach. It's based on a business approach to risk. Uh, in other words, it allows that organizations will take slightly different approaches to risk and therefore have slightly different uh, approaches to how much they're prepared to invest to control a risk, but it nevertheless gives all organizations a basis against which they can uh, determine whether their suppliers have taken a systematic and robust approach to dealing with risk. The key elements of implementing ISO 27001, and ISO 27001 is simply an international standard. You can, uh, it's published by the International Standards Organization in Geneva. Um, you can buy copies of it from uh, any international standards organizations. You can buy it from ANSI, the North American Standards Body. You can buy it from our website in the US. It's the same standard um, everywhere in the world. It, sets out a number of things that an organization must do if it wants to uh, be externally audited and registered as complying with the standards. And the first is to determine a scope of the management system that takes into account the context of the organization and the requirements of interested parties such as customers, stakeholders, uh, staff, um, uh, prosecuting attorneys, uh, state legislators and so on. Somebody needs to be put in charge of information security. There needs to be a responsible individual who ensures that information security is dealt with uh, correctly. And the organization then needs to conduct a risk assessment to identify risks, threats, and vulnerabilities, giving each of those risks an owner who then is accountable for implementing agreed procedures, policies, and technologies to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. This inevitably involves staff training, it inevitably involves uh, staff awareness, and it certainly involves, once your management system is in place and working, an ongoing series of internal audits to provide assurance to management that the system is working effectively. That drives continual improvement, audit identifies weaknesses, identifies things that are not being done properly, and that approach to continual improvement drives uh, improvement in information security posture across the organization as a whole. ISO 27001 therefore brings clearly identifiable benefits to organizations that implement it, and there is growing uh, statistical evidence from organizations that identify they've won new contracts as a result of implementing ISO 27001, that their increased credibility with staff, customer, 
and partner organizations has delivered more opportunities into their hands. It's enabled them to make better decisions on what to invest in controlling information security and putting cost-effective information security in place. It's helped with uh, due diligence on um, uh, uh, requests for quotes, on requests for proposals, uh, and similar. And of course, it's a very effective method of identifying that you've taken appropriate action to comply with uh, a wide range of legal requirements, whether it's industry-specific legislation such as HIPAA or GLBA, or uh, state-level uh, requirements such as a data protection uh, law. But it's industry best practice enabling you to manage business risk in a way that's appropriate for your business. And registration to ISO 27001, usually achieved through an independent registrar, uh, gives that level of assurance to third parties, customers, employees, investors, and other stakeholders that data is safe. It's being dealt with in a way that's appropriate. And that credibility and confidence that you as an organization are operating to an internationally recognized best practice standard that forces you to consider information security associated risks and take steps to meet your fiduciary responsibilities while also meeting the multiple compliance requirements that any organization trading today has to meet is one of the key complex benefits of ISO 27001 certification. And that's, of course, why the take-up of ISO 27001 in the United States is starting to accelerate. Early years have been relatively low numbers from 94 organizations back in 2007 to 566 uh, organizations in uh, 2013, ranging in size from the um, Reserve Bank down to relatively small organizations. The speed of uh, take up is now up to 36%. And what we tend to see at about this point in the growth curve of the take up of a standard, like we saw with ISO 9001, for instance, is that there is an acceleration such that you get to a um, between 10 and 20 fold take up of the standard over the next four to six years. So we would expect to see uh, somewhere between. Um, uh, in the United States, between 10 and 20,000 organizations registered to ISO 27001 in the course of the next four or five years. And so from a competitive point of view, one of the questions that increasingly our clients in the United States are asking is, uh, do we move now to get first mover advantage in our industry sector, in our vertical, in our state, in our city? Uh, do we move now to uh, simplify costs, to simplify compliance advantage? How do we take advantage of what's happening around the rest of the world? And a number of organizations have done exactly that. So Google, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft are examples of three large global organizations that have seen ISO 27001 as a core part of what they're doing, a core structure and framework for how they address uh, information security and how they give assurance to their customers and stakeholders that the way they manage risk is, in, is appropriate for their customers and for their organizations. As I said at the beginning of this webinar, IT governance is a specialist in cybersecurity products and services. What we've done is take the mix of skills, competences, and tools that an organization will need and bundled it together in a solution to which we can give a fixed price, which enables an organization. We deliver these package services to clients all around the world now, to clients ranging from West Coast America through to uh, East Coast uh, Australia. And the packages range from a very basic package, which has got uh, copies of the standards in, in it, and you basically get on with uh, implementing, following what it says in the standard, working out how to do it and doing it yourself, um, 
through to what we call get a lot of help, which is where you still do the work yourself. It's your management system, but you get critical training and implementation in audit skills. You get uh, key software and documentation uh, uh, delivered to you at the outset of the project, plus you get an experienced consultant managing you right the way through the project through to completion. So a range of, uh, of options, uh, you can go and read more about those on our United States website. Uh, they come, as I said, at fixed prices. So uh, for instance, the basics is just $659, uh, ranging up to the Get a Lot of Help package, which is a, the most comprehensive offering at uh, usually just under $17,000, but there is a special offer on that uh, currently at just under $15,000 that runs through until I believe the 27th of uh, this month. For small organizations uh, sitting under 20 employees, we have a fixed price. Uh, we do everything for you, package usually $8,500. We call it the fast track uh, implementation plan, uh, currently on special offer at $7,650, all part of um, our commitment to helping organizations around the world pick up uh, and take advantage of ISO 27001 at a point when the risk from uh, information security and attackers has never been greater. The link which you see on the slide right now will take you to a US website where you can read more about those uh, solutions, find out what's available. Um, you can uh, ask our sales and support team questions if you want to about what's involved and how that operates. And those packages, of course, are available um, on an ongoing basis. If you're in the early stages of assessing how you want to tackle cybersecurity, the packages will still be available um, in a number of months' time. It's only the, uh, the special offer, the um, cash saving advantage, which is available right now. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to the end of uh, what I've been planning to say through uh, through this webinar. Um, so uh, we've got a few minutes left over now for uh, any questions that you may have. Um, the best way to ask a question, um, I can take you all off mute, but we find that that tends to create a huge chunk of background noise, which can be uh, not very good for everybody else in the webinar, um, is to use the chat function, type in any questions in the chat function, it's on the back bottom of your uh, dashboard, the bottom panel, if you just uh, open the chat function, you'll see in there you can type in questions, happy to take any questions you've got, and if you type in whatever your question is, what I'll do is um, I'll share the question back out with uh, with the audience and then um, and then I'll share the answer, so uh, please do go ahead and uh, put any questions in there. So um, one of the questions emerging is um, what's the approach to risk? Should every organization implement the same uh, set of controls? Uh, and the answer is no. The most appropriate set of controls to implement is that set of controls which helps you deal with the risks that are appropriate for your industry and sector. Um, another question, what controls do we implement only the controls in Annex A of ISO 27001? The answer is no, you can draw on controls from anywhere. So NIST SP800 series, for instance, has got a set of controls in there which uh, you can use if they're appropriate for your market. ISO 27001 is simply a, uh, a set of requirements for how you design the management system which leads you to select and implement uh, specific controls. So ladies and gentlemen, as I said, any questions do put them in the chat function or alternatively uh, use the questions um, uh, question function. Let me just, uh, there are a couple of other questions I need to get there. ISO 27001 d does, sorry for those of you who ask, yes the slides will be distributed. Um, ISO 27001 uh, doesn't recommend encryption. One of the controls in ISO 27001 is encryption. What ISO 27001 says is you choose controls to meet your risk requirements. If you're sending sensitive personal information uh, out, then you should select encryption as a, uh, as a control. Uh, sensitive Data, yes, organizations that were sending sensitive information out uh, by email, 
which is encrypted wouldn't have been breached. Organizations storing sensitive information that was encrypted wouldn't have been breached. So an organization that stores a password file where a C-suite executive has a password file available in plain text is just plain stupid. Any such information, if you're storing it, should be stored in um, high algorithm uh, encrypted format um, and should not be available in any easily accessible segment of a network drive. It's, uh, yeah, it's such a critical uh, piece of information. You would have thought that any basic um, cybersecurity person would understand it, but they don't. Uh, we, has the PCI DSS shifted towards focusing on encryption of data rather than preventing breaches? Uh, PCI has shifted very much towards, uh, more and more towards a very rigid set of requirements around preventing breaches. So it's giving you some very specific, very detailed requirements uh, about what you have to do uh, depending on your payment card uh, processing environment. And it's a very important difference between PCI and ISO 27001. PCI is prescriptive about the controls that you uh, have to uh, put in place. Um, the ISO 27001 is prescriptive about the management system that you put in place that enables you to choose the controls. So for many organizations implementing PCI, you find yourself having to implement controls that are more expensive than you need to or inappropriate for your organization because of the extent to which PCI is prescriptive. ISO 27001 allows an organization the flexibility to select appropriate controls and put them in place inside the uh, organization. Uh, the, there's been a, uh, there is a view that because of the payouts from insurance companies, the actual loss to a number of organizations like Target, Home Depot and so on has been uh, as a, at a net figure lower than uh, originally uh, estimated. Um, and that's an estimate. Uh, the reality is that the damage to those people whose records have been compromised, the damage to an organized reputation, there's no insurance payout that can help an organization recover effectively from that. And one of the things that follows from a um, insurance payout is, of course, an increase in insurance premiums. And in the long run, um, insurance, while it might uh, mitigate the cost of a single catastrophic loss, is not an effective method of dealing with cyber breaches. There have been CIOs and CISOs over the years who said, nah, we'll just put in place a good cyber security policy. And when, it's, when we're breached, we'll just claim on cyber security insurance. Well, you know, Cyber security insurance companies are not stupid. Uh, they kind of uh, increasingly write into their policies a requirement that organizations take appropriate steps to manage and mitigate cyber security losses so that when you suffer a cyber security loss and it turns out that you failed to encrypt passwords and the password file, they're going to say, well, uh, take a hike, uh, friend. You're not getting paid. You're in breach of the requirements around cybersecurity here yourself. Uh, will insurance premiums decrease if an organization can demonstrate higher levels of compliance is a good question. Uh, we're seeing a growing number of uh, organizations specifically saying if you have a specific cybersecurity certification, you can pay less for your cyber uh, compliance insurance. So we're expecting a number of companies in the United Kingdom, for instance, to go live in the next short while with a statement saying that they'll offer uh, reduced rate premiums to organizations who've uh, successfully put in place a new UK cybersecurity certification called Cyber Essentials. And I expect we'll see, because um, this is a, insurance is a competitive market, we'll see variants of that appearing over the course of the next uh, couple of years. Um, Somebody asking about the Poneman single breach cost. Uh, no, this is the average breach rather than uh, the um, 
in, in the largest uh, largest breach. So this is kind of averaged across the total amount of uh, losses that Poneman identify and the total number of breaches and they arrive at their average uh, cost of breach there on that uh, on that figure is the answer to that question. We're kind of coming to the end of the time that was available for this webinar folks. If there's one uh, final question, I'm more than happy to take it, but technically we're uh, pretty well out of time. I'll just pause for one moment in case anybody has another question they want to ask. Nope. Well, thank you for being disciplined in controlling the number of questions you've got, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you all for being on this webinar. I hope it's been uh, useful. I know our US website increasingly is uh, seeking to provide a range of resources and information uh, to organizations about information and cybersecurity. Uh, and I'd encourage you to draw on that information, uh, look at the packages that are available to help you address cybersecurity. But the key message I would give you is that cybersecurity is a danger today. You need to be taking action to deal with it today, not next week, next month, next year, because in that period, uh, you're likely to have been breached, not once, but multiple times. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being on the seminar today and do enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Good afternoon.